we are so glad that you're here to receive God's word. And this message that I have for you this morning is this. You're, you're going to have to, well, you can do it. You kind of have a choice all the time. But I want to talk to you about some things that I hope is going to be uh, significantly deep enough that you are going to walk away and have the ability to say, hey, you know what, some of the things that I've been doing uh, I don't need to let that affect my freedom anymore. And so I want to encourage you to just take it in and receive what God has for you this morning. Before we do that, let's give our campuses that are joining us a little shout. Because they are here and they're giving you a shout back. There we go. All right. Over the last little while, if you've been here, uh, I've been talking to you about your heart. And your heart is not that ooey gooey thing that you hear in pop music. It's actually the center, according to the Bible, it's the center of your being. It's what you make your decisions out of. It's what you love the most in your heart is actually what guides you. And I think you would agree with this, is that in our society right now, is we have this sense of if I feel something really deeply, then it must be right. Is that, is that true? You know, and the problem with that is that that's actually not the biblical understanding of what is going on in your life. And we learn in Proverbs, it says, above all things, guard your heart. So in other words, just because I feel something super deeply about who I am or who I love or what I do, doesn't actually mean that it's true. So guard your heart for everything. And every time I read this verse, it gets me. Everything I do comes out of it. And so this is huge and important for us, and we've learned that there are things that could control us that we don't even want to be controlled by if we don't guard our heart. And over, and over the last little while, just do a quick summary, and that's this, is that uh, greed, which is I'm owed, that's kind of the lie in, in that, is really that sense of you owe me, and it can grab a hold of us, and it can stop us from living the way we should live. The antidote is actually we need to be generous. You and I are called to this. We are way makers for other people. This is not about you. God's put you in a place. He's surrounded you with people. He's given you resources and gifts so you can make a way for others. And that is where you find true joy in your life. Uh, the second thing we looked at, second emotion that control you is jealousy. And in that jealousy is this, is as we're pointing at the people around, I want that, I want that, I want that, we, uh, we didn't realize until we thought it through is that what we're saying is actually God, you owe me. Because God is his hand on everything. He's the one that put our life. He gave you your looks. He gave you your gifts. He gave everything. So when we are going like this, we're actually saying, God, you owe me. And it's a thought that we need to grab a hold of. The antidote of that is we're saying, you know what, God, we get to celebrate all the good things around us because a habit breaks a habit. And so we're going to get in the habit of celebrating all the good things around that people have. And the thing I want to talk to you about today is something different than that. And here's how I'm going to introduce it. We're in summer mode, which means that we're taking trips everywhere and going around. And so I'd like to ask you this. How many of you this summer or have or will be taking a plane trip. Oh, very cool. Yeah, this means you gotta wait a lot and everything like that, but it's not bad, still pretty good. Where you get to is great, you can go there. How many of you were taking a train trip or will be? All those people are late, they're not here. <laughs> if you've taken a train, you know what I'm talking about. Right? <laughs> good scenery though, right? You travel along, you get to see all sorts of stuff really slowly. Uh, how about an automobile, automobile trip? How many of you are going in the car somewhere and just road tripping it? Yeah, Eileen and I did that this year. We actually went just hauled down to Thunder Bay and straight back, kind of, and just saw all sorts of stuff. And we saw like bears and moose and, and great city. We live in a great country, all sorts of good stuff. Uh, now, okay, you are my, the next group of people, you are my people. How many of you are doing a motorcycle trip? Ha ha! <laughs> I knew it. You're some of you people who are, uh, this is whew, the wind in your face, freedom, you're going to make it happen. I have a friend of mine who says, you know what you call motorcycle drivers? Organ donors. <laughs> <laughs> so last one is this. How many of you have planned this summer or you've already decided to take a guilt trip? No? Nobody? 
yeah, here's the thing, guys. We never plan that. We never think, oh, I'm going to take a guilt trip. But it's actually what happens to us. And if it isn't happening now, it's going to happen in your life. Because all of us do things that we are not very proud of. And we get in that place. And this is one of those things that the enemy uses over and over again in your life and the life of the people around you is he uses guilt. And I want to talk to you this morning about how you can be free from guilt. The bad thing about guilt is it always gets you looking back. And God says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to put your past behind and press on to what is ahead. And there are seasons in our life, and sometimes there are parts of, whole parts of our life where we are just looking back, and we are bound by guilt. And we have to find a way, and God has given us a way that you can break free from that guilt. And I want to talk to you about some uh, really foundational things this morning about how you can break free from it. Some of you, I, some of this I know you have heard, but I hope that in hearing it, there's some things that just turn a little bit because God wants you looking forward. He wants you to live in freedom. He wants to see your future be something that you can be excited about. Uh, there's a, a friend of ours from way, way, way back, and she, in her early teens, actually became pregnant. And uh, clearly that was uh, sort of this life-affecting thing. And as she lived her life, and as we watched from a distance, we could see so clearly how she was always looking back in everything that they'd done. She was really, really hard on people, but there was no person that she was harder on than herself. And there was a reason for it, looking back all the time. And in her relationship with God, walk with God, had a really great godly mom and, and you know, could have moved that. But everything that she did, she would, like every time she talked about God, she's a Christian, there was this sadness about her. And I was like, oh man, that is just painful to watch. Because her whole life along, she kind of lived in that place of saying, you know what, that thing that I did. And the enemy completely took her out in her life. All of us have things like that, that if we allow it, if we don't bring the truth to bear on it, it's gonna, it's gonna have potential to take you off of what God has you to be. Um, there's a, a story that I thought was really poignant on this, and you, you know from history Joseph Stalin, who is probably one of the most horrible people that have ever lived, Mi- like literally millions of people, of his own people that he killed and starved and did all sorts of unspeakable things, and a lot of what came from him was his psychologist, this very, very demented man, and he made this statement, and I think I want you to get how guilt can affect us. He says, you know what, I can get any Anybody, you let me sit down in a room with them, and I can get anybody, anybody at all, to confess to things that they have never done. I thought, hmm, that's interesting. You know who he did it? He called it uh, the Mongolian Peasant Principle. And I want you to just kind of track with me on this story. And he said, this is how, this is how he does it. He says, that, here's the, the, the story that he tells. There is a, a poor Mongolian uh, peasant. He's shabby and doesn't think very much of himself. He gets invited to the palace of the general, and the general has money, and he has all those things kind of for and, and ready to go, and he invites him into this opulent room with a desk that's pure oak, and he looks him in the eye, and he says, I will give you a million rubles if you press this red button. He says, what happens if I press this red button? He says, if you press that red button, an old peasant in Mongolia will die. He says, well, that's terrible. What did he do? Nothing. It's for the good of everybody, but I'm going to give you this million rubies if you just press that button. And he sees himself, and he sees this austere, auspicious man in front of him, and he slowly pushes the red button. He goes takes all, it, was, it wasn't a trick, he takes all of the million rubles and he goes back to his place and from that moment on, he lives in complete guilt of what he's done, what he thinks he's done. 
Five years later, his guilt piles up and piles up and piles up so high that he kills himself. The state comes back, takes back all his money on his funeral. And this is what Stalin's psychologist says, is that over the time, he says, there, are, there is nothing that I can't get people to confess to do because everybody has a Mongolian peasant in their mind. All I have to do is I have to search around and I just have to dangle it in front of their eyes and they are gonna confess to anything. I thought, ooh, that's like evil. But you know what? It's exactly what the enemy does in your life. He digs around, he finds things, and he dangles them in front of you and you're gonna confess to anything because of the guilt and the shame of what you've actually done. I've been, you may not have thought of it this way before, I've been shocked how many people that over the years I've talked to, 30 years pastoring, of people who come in and say, you know what, I'm feeling guilty and I actually have no idea what I'm feeling guilty about. It's because the enemy is continually working to wear you down because you know you've done some things and that guilt and that shame gets jammed in your heart and unless you take care of it, you're always going to be looking back, and it might not even be about stuff that you've done. That's how the enemy works in your life. So we're going to talk this morning about how do you break that? How do you break it so you're looking forward, you're not looking back? The good news is all of us have done horrible, awful things. You don't seem that happy. No, no, misery loves company, right? No, it doesn't love company, does it? <laughs> it's personal. It's who you are. And you can keep looking at that, or you can say, okay, God, uh, I want to take care of this. I want to live my life free. That is not what it is. Now, I think you know this. There are two kinds of guilt. There's good guilt and bad guilt. Uh, good guilt is the kind of thing when you do something wrong and you acknowledge it and you say, oh, man, I can't do that again. And that's called conviction right? And the Holy Spirit lives in you, and he convicts you, and you make it happen. Bad guilt is what we're going to be talking about today. That guilt that, you know, the enemy will kind of try to trick you and say, oh, no, it's not that bad, it's not that bad, and he'll minimize it. And then when you do it, he'll maximize it. He'll just say, oh, you're a terrible Christian, and you could never amount to anything, and look what you did. Dangle it right in front of you. It's that bad guilt that we're gonna go at because God has more for you, amen? You are not about looking back. You are about looking forward about what God has in your life. Everybody has that stuff, what do we do with it? Uh, there are things that we do with our guilt and uh, it starts like this. You can bury, blame, or beat. And uh, the Bible says in Proverbs 28, whoever conceals his sin, does not prosper. You can kind of rationalize yourself away, right? You can say, well, you know, everybody's doing it. I kind of steal from my employer a little bit, but you know, he laid us off two weeks before and he stole from us. And there's all sorts of ways that we can do this. You can minimize, you can compromise. Everybody's kind of doing it. You can blame. And uh, most of the time, it's kind of where we land, is, you know, like, like you're in the Garden of Eden, Adam takes a bite of the apple, he knows it's wrong, and Adam takes it like a man and blames his wife. And he's, <laughs> what his words are like hilarious, right? He just finished doing the thing that he knew was wrong, it wasn't like he got tricked, right? He knew it was wrong, and he did it, and he says to God, it's that woman you gave me. <laughs> like, it's somebody else's fault. It can't be my fault. And there's always that justice because this guilt is about this is what I, you owe me. And there's an owed part in guilt. And I am, I owe you. It keeps coming over and over. And something has to just, has to satisfy that I owe you in your life. And what are you going to do? Burying it, blaming, uh, beating it isn't going to make it happen. Uh, Psalm 38, this is in the message, which isn't a translation, but it's, uh, it's a paraphrase. In Psalm 38, the message says this. David, after he sinned, uh, I've lost 20 pounds in two months because of your accusations. 
My bones are brittle as dry sticks because of my sin. I'm swamped by my bad behavior, collapsed under gunny sacks of guilt. The cuts in my flesh stink and grow maggots because I've behaved so badly. And now I'm flat on my face, feeling sorry for myself from morning to night. All of my insides are on fire. My body is a wreck. And I'm on my last leg. I've had it. My life is a vomit of groans. And we can get in that place, and all of us can get in that place, and the more you stuff it in and bury it, or beat yourself up on it, you get in that place, and there is a better way to do it. And this is the cycle, this is the bad cycle that you get into, and it's called the shame cycle. And the shame cycle is this, you do something which everybody does, you kind of keep it in private, and you keep it in there and make it happen, and then you try to pay it off somehow internally, and you can pay it off by doing good things. If you're a Christian, you might serve. If, you, if you're a Christian, you might even think you can pray it off. Anybody done that for over and over and over? I have my hand up, yes, over and over. You can confess something, and at the end of the day, you keep looking back. That is not the way God wants you to live. But this is the pattern, if you keep living the same way, that you're gonna end up. So what does the good pattern look like? So far, lots of bad news. I know, we'll get there. Uh, The freedom cycle is this. You do that same bad thing, because you're on this side of heaven. Uh, Instead, what you do is, and this is really important, that you fully confess to God and to others that if possible, you actually look at making restitution in your life. And we're going to unpack those two a little bit more. And then you have the ability to focus on your future. Then you have freedom. uh, And then you have joy in your life. So what does that that freedom cycle look like in your life? Uh, This is is, uh, Psalm 51, David's sort of classic thing. I think you probably remember the story, right? David, man after God's own heart, hero of the Old Testament, Uh, supposed to be doing what kings do, go out, fight, do his thing, and he ends up uh, on his roof looking around, and he happens to look around and see Bathsheba, who is bathing on her roof, and he sees her, and he lusts after her, and he takes her, and then eventually he he impregnates her, then figures out that this guy is one of his, his men, his wife, and so he gets him killed, schemes, does the whole thing. It is like the trifecta of ugly that happens in his life. And after he's done this whole thing in Psalm 51, not one week, not one month, not two months, not six months, but 12 months, David does nothing. Other than that verses that I told you about everything that was happening inside of him, But for a whole year, he just plays king. And he does his stuff. And and, uh, you remember what happened to Bathsheba and the baby? Died, right? Wake up call? Mm Mm-mm. His good friend who he uh, met and spent time with, because he was related to the the man who he had killed, uh, he no longer will have anything to do with him. And he laments it. He said, hey, we used to go to the temple together. We used to praise God together. And he says, ah, but now you won't come with me. Mm, hello. For a whole year, David does nothing, and it wrecks him inside. And then he comes, and the prophet, cagey old guy, tells him a story, and you, you probably remember the story, that there's a man with a bunch of lambs, and then there's a poor man with one lamb, and he appeals to David's sense of justice, and I'm gonna meet out justice, I'm gonna do what's right, because I'm the king. And he says, they take that one, the man with one lamb, the guy takes the lamb away from him, and David is furious, and he's throwing things around, and he just says, who is that man, I'm gonna, and Nathan turns around, and he just looks at it, and this is that moment, right? And he looks at him, and he's square in the eye. And he says, David, you are that man. And all the bones inside of him that had been breaking, and all the guilt and shame that had just been pouring down over him at that moment, just the dam breaks. Did I mention that God is relentlessly, passionately after your heart? 
and he is going to go because he loves you and he doesn't want you to live like that. And David's a wreck. And we see in Psalm 51, part of the process of getting free, and I want to read that, those verses to you. And in Psalm 53, verses 1 and 2, he says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. And you, you get to read the highlighted parts coming. According to your great compassion, blot out my... Wash away all my... Cleanse me from my... I know my... My... Sin is always before me. Hmm. I don't think he's minimizing anything, do you? Transgressions, sin, iniquity. He says, you know what? I, this is me. This is who I am. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim it. I'm not going to water it down. I'm going to call it what it is. Transgressions are literally revolting against God's law. Iniquity is sort of the perverseness of our nature. Uh, sin is basically missing the mark and doing evil before God. And he says, this is it. This is what I did. This is who I am in this situation. And he just lays it out. There's no blame there on anybody else. There's nothing anywhere else. He just said, this is it. And guys, I think this is our first step. If we're really gonna be free, if we're really gonna allow stuff doing, we have to pull away from blaming other people and from pointing fingers at somebody else. And we have to acknowledge it for what it is. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, this is one of those sort of unflattering stories. Uh, I, was, I, have a, I had a neighbor way back who was uh, super chatty. And, and I enjoy talking. I'm an extrovert type person. But this guy was like somewhere out there. I could not go out of my house. And he would start talking. And I'm actually, I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm actually pretty good at closing conversations. It's a skill that I've developed over the years. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, a little confession there too. Um, but I could, this, there was no closing with this guy, right? He was just going and going and going. And in some ways, I kind of felt captive in my own home because he would talk all and he was like my neighbor and he was right there. And I'm a pastor, so I'm supposed to be nice. <sighs> and so he, he says, hey, Aubrey, I'll do this. And he saw something in my house that needed doing. He says, I'll fix up this thing for you. And he says, oh, yeah. He says, you know, I, I'm a contractor, and I'll just tell the boss it's like warranty work on some of the thing that we did. And we'll do. I said, no, 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 don't do that. Like, just, he says, oh, no, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. And I was like, oh. And eventually, something happened along the way, and he couldn't do what he had promised to do. And I noticed that he was avoiding me because he was feeling guilty. And I thought, sweet. <laughs> this, is, this is like, thank you, Jesus. This could not have worked out better. This is a terrible story. You know? And so I did this. And like first week, I thought this is fantastic. I went on my deck. I'm like, yes. He was there. I just waved. He took off. <laughs> Happy dance. <laughs> Except I went, it went on and on and on. And I realized, you know, I kind of had him dangling, right? And I was sort of pulling on his little guilt chain. But I actually kind of let going and going and going and going way too long. Uh, and, you know, and there was time that got lost, and eventually my neighbor moved. I did make it right quite before that, but there's a bunch of time that got lost that I could have connected with him that I didn't because I was holding on to thing. And eventually, what I had to do is, you know, uh, now I'm admitting it to all of you, but it was way harder to go to my wife in the first place and just say, hey, you know what I've actually done? I've actually just been, you know, dangling him on and letting him be all guilty and wiggle on his my little hook that I've got him on because I just didn't want to deal with him. You know, I don't know who you care about looking good in front of. I actually care a lot about looking good in front of her. And uh, that didn't look real good. No, I don't look really good in front of you either, but whatever. This <laughs> is so what happens when you're free. You don't have to worry about it, right? And, you know, eventually I went back to the guy and said, hey, you know what, don't worry about it. And you know what I had done? I'd rationalized saying that, well, if I go to him now, then he's going to feel really bad that he can't do it and everything. And made, oh, yeah, like just totally minimized it and made it look like, like I was the better person in this scenario, but actually it wasn't. All I was doing was just making it convenient for me and just dangling him. 
I want to think. And you and I all have stories like that where we do, where God is, is in the process of saying, I'm going to call you out, and I'm going to, I want you to call sin what it is. And I want you to just be honest with yourself. That's the first thing. Can you really be honest with yourself so you can be honest with God and the people around you? Hey, you know what? I did it. Not their fault, not anything else. David eventually says, you know what? I sinned against you and you alone, God. Done. Busted. I got nothing. And if we're really, really going to get free from stuff, it's the place that we start, is calling sin, sin, and just saying, hey, you know what? There's no excuse. I call it what it is. And the second thing that we see that's really important for us is that, that our conscience, that the most important thing in confessing is not actually conscience relief. It's actually having us not just feel better, but to do the right thing. And in our life, as we're, if we're really going to be free from this, the, the second thing that you need to do is, is probably the more difficult thing, and that is to not have just a private confession with God, but you might actually have to have a personal confession with somebody else. I don't know about you, I find it a lot easier to confess to God. Right? I can t- tell God all sorts of stuff, right? But if I have to go to you who I disappointed, and you're gonna, and, and in my mental process, in your mental process is like, they're gonna think way less of me. If I, if I go to him and I tell him what I've done and who I am, and he's gonna have all these things, and by the time I'm done, I am, this enemy, ha, the enemy has put me in a puddle on the bottom of the floor. I don't know what your experience, but it's almost been universal in my experience when I've gone to somebody and really, really humbled myself, and just said, you know what, I was an idiot, I'm so sorry, I did this. All those things that I thought were gonna happen, none of them happened. And especially because you're Christians, you have to love me, so, ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's what the enemy whispers in your ear, that if you, want, if you want forgiveness, you talk to God. What does James chapter five says? If you want healing, you need to talk to somebody else about it. Confess your sins one to another so you may be healed. You know what I think we do? We skip the second part. God actually doesn't forgive excuses. He forgives confessions when we're willing to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And I think, guys, first step is we got to call it what it is. Second step, you got to be willing to confess it, not just to God. That's important, right? It's to be really, truly honest to him. But you have to be willing to confess it to the person or to the people or to someone else. And and, Because otherwise, it's in darkness. And when the light shines in, all of a sudden, there's freedom. When you're in darkness... That's where the enemy lurks in your life. The third thing is this, is that you want to have a place where you can have restitution. And sometimes in your life, you need to do that. You need to not only confess fully and just go to that person, but sometimes you actually need to do something to to make good for the thing that you've done. And uh, if you look at Zacchaeus, he was the the corrupt tax collector. His, His true confession was that he set it out and he said, you know what, I have been a scoundrel and a tax collector and here's what I'm going to do. And he looks at Jesus. Of all the people you want to confess to, it was like Jesus. You're going to be Jesus, by the way. Woo-hoo. He looked Jesus in the eye and he said, okay, I'm going to give half of my wealth away and if I've robbed anybody, I'm going to give them back four times what I've robbed them. I'm looking at the math on that and I'm thinking, wow, that doesn't leave them much, does it? <laughs> You ever done the math on that? That seems bad. But there there are some of you that are jammed up right now in your heart because God actually wants you to bring restitution to somebody. And and you know what? This is going to go way better than what you thought it was going to go. Because there is nothing that turns away wrath like a soft answer. And if you come in humility, you know, there's no guarantee, right? But if you come in humility and you say, hey, you know what? I did this, and here's what I believe I'm supposed to do. 
Guys, that's when you get free. And the enemy has no place in your life, and there's nothing jammed in your heart, and you don't have to look back. You can look forward. I, I love what, at the end of David's uh, kind of confessional that he has here in, in Psalm 51, verse 12 and 13, he says this, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Whose joy is it? Whose joy is it? God's. Yeah, my joy, psh, all over the place, right? It says, your, the joy of your salvation. Yeah. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. And he says in verse 13, then I will teach transgressors their ways so that sinners may turn back to you. Now, I'm not sure if you've thought of it that way, but that's that, like David's purpose in life. He says, the only way that I get to my purpose in life, to doing what I'm supposed to be doing, to be about making stuff happen, uh, I know that God actually, in, in part, I've told you this before, I'm not just a pastor. God says that I want you to be a light in your neighborhood. And, and I was being a very crappy light when I was avoiding the guy, right? God put me in that space for that time with that guy. And I couldn't do what I was supposed to do. My, some of my greatest joy has come from seeing people around me get to know Jesus. And I cut myself off from my future by just choosing that. And God says, that's how you look to your future when you see and understand that that's what freedom comes when you confess. That's when you let it all go, when you say, I'm not going to just talk to God, I'm going to talk to somebody else. And if there's a chance for restitution, I'm going to do it. Uh, there is a, a garden in Japan that I, I f came across this. I thought this was really interesting. It's called the Zojili Gardens. And it's a garden in memory of unborn children and whether they're miscarried or stillborn or aborted. And what they do is they give each one of these people who come there one of those statues. And they get to, to put stuff on it, do whatever uh, they would like to do with it. And many of them are statues for unborn children. And people come, and probably the most poignant plaque on the wall of all these ones was this. It said, you are a baby, I will never forget you. From the bottom of my heart, I ask for forgiveness forever and ever. Here's what I want you to know. There are some things in your life that you are not going to be able to make restitution for. There's some people you might not be able to talk to. But there is a place that God has for you that nobody else has in this world. It's a place where the blood of Jesus meets your life. Every one of us, this is what we have that the world doesn't have. God does something that is miraculous. It's out of sight. He says, I will, put my, I will put your sin behind my back. It's out of mind. He says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. It's out of reach. He says, you will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea and it's out of existence. He says, I, even I, he blots out all your transgressions for my sake, and he remembers your sins no more. Yeah, you can give God a hand for that. Here, here's what I'd like you to do to, to just sort of close it off. Would you mind just bowing your heads and closing your eyes? That when we get in that place, there are some steps that we can do, but ultimately, guys, when we get in a place, the only place that, that, the place that we find the fullness of it is at the cross of Jesus. And, and this is my picture. If you, if you want to get a different picture, that's okay. I know who I am. I know that I fail regularly and often. But Jesus says this. The blood of Jesus washes away all of our sins, Scripture says. And so I'd like you to just, my picture is this. Is I, I literally see myself walking through uh, like a, a waterfall of the blood of Jesus. 
I come in as the person that I am, and literally as the blood washes over me, Jesus' blood that he died in my place, it isn't that he winks at sin, it's incredibly costly. It costs him his life. As I walk through that blood, I come out the other side, and I stand before Jesus and before God completely clean and pure. I almost have to look back and think, what? Really? That is who we are. And so for some of you today, as we just take this moment to be quiet before God, there's some of you that need to walk through the blood. And this is just symbolic. It's just to help you get a handle on this. There's some of you that have been looking back, and it actually, that guilt emotion is controlling you. And you may not have even known it up until today, but God's known it, and he is not going to let that be your destiny. So if there's something that you need to walk through the blood of Jesus, so it's out of mind and out of existence, that it's out of reach, and it's out of sight. Take a moment just in your mind's eye to do that right now. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, that there is nothing that we have done or could do that the blood of Jesus isn't powerful enough to wash away. I, Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters right now that uh, for those who have been just carrying some things, for those who have been looking back, uh, for some things they can do, re they can reach out, but for other things, it's just this. And this is exactly what they need, the blood of Jesus just pouring over them and that they are forgiven and that they are free. Lord, we just want to pause and thank you for that costly, costly work of the cross that allows us to live in freedom. I thank you, God, for who you are. I thank you, Jesus, for dying for all of our sins. And I thank you, Lord, that today is the day of freedom as we can let go, as we can say, Jesus, there is none like you. Your blood washes away all of our sins. Amen? Amen. 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 Why don't you stand? I'd like you to just bow your heads and close your eyes one more time. Uh, the most important decision that you can make, and maybe you've made it or you have and you've kind of slipped away from it, is to allow Jesus to uh, really come and to be the leader in your life, to give him leadership. And, you know, sometimes we think, well, I hope my good outweighs my bad. Uh, I got some news for you. Your good will never outweigh your bad. Jesus died for that. And so if that's you today, without anybody looking around, and if you don't have to go, please don't. You want to take a moment and just say, you know what, God, I can't get rid of my guilt. I know what I've done. There's no excusing it. I'm going to call it what it is. And I'm going to call out to you, would you, Jesus, come and take away my guilt by the cross? If that's you today without anybody looking around, and I'm not going to call you forward or anything like that, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I see hands coming up all over the place. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Praise God. Yeah, you can put your hands down. Anybody else? And, and I want to focus this, this time now is like maybe you have never done this before and you're here or you've never really done it and you want to say, you know what, I need to do this now. If that's you today, would you just raise your hand up and I'll acknowledge it and you can put it back down. Thank you. Yeah, I see that hand, man. That's awesome. Yeah, thank you in the back. That's great. Thank you in the front. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, thank you, ma'am. That's great. Praise God. Good. You can put your hands down. We're going to pray a prayer together, and it's a prayer of freedom. I was saying that I don't have to live under that curse of guilt, 
because of what Jesus did, and you're going to accept it, and we can all pray it together. If you raised your hand, pray with all your heart. This is all about what Jesus did. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his shed blood, that he died for my sins. There is nothing I can do about them. I call sin, sin, and I choose to receive fully and completely the power of the blood of Jesus. I thank you that I am free, that my sins are blotted out. It is out of mind and out of existence. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him a hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God.